so yeah, what, what am I going to talk about? Um, so I guess something about geometry and integrability. So, so, so roughly the main message of uh, this talk uh, will be that there is this new way of constructing solutions of the young master equation based on ideas coming from geometry, and I think this is very exciting and a uh, new approach in, in, in our whole subject. And um, um, well, let, let me start maybe with this very abstract view, which is this kind of remark about analogies between homology theories and um, um, integral, quantum integral systems. So there's this remark which was made in an old paper in 1994, which I only found fairly recently, and it struck me that this is already um, the beginning of this story that actually unfolded much later, that if you look at so-called exceptional cohomology theories, which are just various types of, you know, like you tried to attempt at classifying various types of cohomology theories, whatever that is, don't worry if you don't know what that is, we'll say a word about the simplest case later, but there's this notion of cohomology theories, and they're usually classified by curves uh, with an additive law. So basically just um, pick your favorite um, algebraic curve, like complex plane, say, so there are only three examples anyway, so let me just write them. Say, say we only, work, let, let's do it, since we face this, we only work with the complex numbers. So let's say, if you look at complex curves, which have an additive uh, law, so either you take the, the full complex plane with the, the addition, or you take the complex plane minus zero and multiplication, or you have elliptic curves, which are parameterized by tau, which is your elliptic modulus. And these are all the um, uh, curves with uh, you know, the abelian group law. And, and actually, homology theories are actually classified by, by in, 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 through these three groups, and this is ordinary homology, which is all we're going to talk about today anyway. And this is so-called K-theory, and this is so-called elliptic uh, homology. And when you see this, immediately you say, oh, but this looks very familiar, because we know that so these are homology theories. Uh, but you know that when you view quantum integral systems, there are three types of quantum integral systems. There are rational quantum integral systems, uh, trigonometric, and elliptic integral systems. And, 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 and of course, you even know what these, uh, this uh, abelian uh, group mean. This is just nothing but the spectral parameters. This is the addi additive spectral parameters, multiplicative and elliptic spectral parameters. So the obvious, obvious question is where, whether there is a connection between these two things. And the answer is, it turns out to be surprisingly, well, yes, okay, that's not surprising, but it turns out to be a very tight connection, and this has been em emphasized in the last 10 years by various people, actually, very implicitly in my work with uh, Felipe Francesco and Alan Wilson, we already found part of this connection at the level of the front level, level of homology, and various people, including people in the audience, like uh, Christian Korf and um, the Spiegel who have worked very much on the K-theory case, and by now, and also Romani Titanos and Bashenkar, and by now, the elliptic case is more or less understood due to the work of Okunkov. And Okunkov really worked on all these things and generalized a lot all of these uh, ideas. So I should probably, well, I'm going to write these names a bit. Um, yeah, so there are quite a few people that, that worked on this. And I sort of worked on this on and off, but by now I'm sort of back, back into this subject. And um, so today, so, so roughly what are these cohomology theories in sort of geometric setting? That means you have some space, like some variety manifold or whatever, and you associate to it some algebraic data, and this is this these cohomologies, and the, and the claim is that out of this uh, algebraic data, you're going to build a solution of the young master equation. And so maybe to, the goal of today would be to explain this in the very simplest setting. So we're going to work only with one variety, which you all know, and this is P1, which is just the Riemann sphere. I think I can assume that everybody has seen the Riemann sphere figure before, right? And I claim that already, already out of this thing, we're going to get some interesting integral systems. So it's a national sphere, right? With its complex structure, yeah. Okay. So CP1, but I'm never going to write this here. We are all only going to work with complex, get on complex numbers. All right. So the next thing you want to do is associate to this some kind of algebraic data. And again, I'm only going to work ever in this talk with the first. So just ordinary homology of homology that you also actually I'm, I'm going to use the homological language because that's the most kind of intuitive way to find things. So the question is, what is what does it mean to take the Homology of homology of P1, the Riemann sphere. So this is topological. At this stage, we don't really need the complex structure. It's just, just literally just the sphere. And the question is: so if, you, if you've seen once in your life about homology, it's about this is about cycles, right? Non-trivial cycles. So for example, what you can do is you can take a point. Okay, maybe if this is the equator, then I guess Natal is probably somewhere, right? 
And um, so, yeah, so you take your point and you say, by definition, this is a non-trivial non cycle in there. So, so you have class of a point, let me use bracket to say the class. But of course, if you take another point, you can always connect them by a line. That means they're cohomologous. That means any point, you know, there's only really one point, right? And any point is equivalent to any other point in, in homology. So you have just class of a point, any point. And then you have the class of, oh, then you might say, what about curves? Uh, curves, but that doesn't count because the curve is always the boundary of a disk. You know, the, the sphere is completely trivial um, homologically, so that any curve is the boundary of a disk, that means it's trivial homologically. So the only thing left, so that doesn't count. And the only thing left, left is the whole space. There's no way to consider that the space is the boundary of something, so you have the class, class of the whole. And so the answer is just C2. That's it. It's the, the free group generated by, the given group generated by two classes, which are these two classes generated. It's, oh, incidentally, there's a group of natural grading on, on homology of homology by dimensions. So this has, let's say, dimension zero. It has dimension, complex dimension one, let's say. Um, yeah. Probably want to use the uh, reverse grading. But let, let me switch signs and let's say that this has dimension, co-dimension, yeah, let, let me grade by co-dimension rather than dimension. So this has co-dimension zero, this has co-dimension one. All right, so this is homology. So this is kind of, roughly speaking, kind of like the Hilbert space of our integral system in Haydn. Um, so in this case, it's a, of course, at, at some point I'm gonna replace Z by just a C or Q or whatever you like, so you can always sort of, um, but the important thing here is the two, it's, it's a break two, so it's a two-dimensional space. Um, now, we want to do a little bit more. We wanted to introduce spectral parameters uh, because otherwise there's no R matrix. And so now comes the tricky bit. This is the most difficult part of this talk, so let's, let's try to do this. So now we're going to actually look a little bit more in detail what is P1. So it's the sphere, right, but it's three. Well, it's coming now. So now we're going to discuss a little bit more what, what the Riemann sphere is. So it's really just the C union infinity, right? It's the, it's, so you, let, let me mark a point, let's say the North Pole being infinity, and all the rest is just a complex matrix, yeah? And maybe I'll also mark the South Pole for future use to be zero, right? And then you have your generic point at Natal, which is just a, some number, complex number zero, yeah? So what are the, um, so there's a group naturally acting on, on P1, I claim. So this is the next important data. So what is the group acting on P1? Well, uh, this is the group of uh, automorphisms of the Riemann sphere. These are Mobius transformations. So that means when you have a complex number, including possibly infinity, you can do C goes to AZ plus B uh, over CZ plus D, where, uh, let's say, uh, A, D minus uh, whatever, uh, C is non-zero, right? So, so some GL2 action, basically. So these numbers are just complex numbers, right? And, and this, is, this is actually a nice morphism. Yeah, a Mobius transformation. So that means, in other words, you have an action of GL2, so, so this is just ordinary homology. So you have GL2 acting on P1, and really, if you want to be pedantic, yeah, so, yeah, let me call it G. And, uh, yeah, so, so it, it acts naturally on, on uh, P1, and if you want to be pedantic, you realize that if you multiply A, B, C, D by uh, the, the same number, it doesn't change the action. So really, it's not SL2, it's actually P, sorry, it's not L2, it's actually P, G, L2 acting, or P, S, L2, I think it's the same, right? So, so you have this very simple group. This is almost the same as SL2, right? It's, it means it's just a group of rank one. Um, oh, right. Well, that's good. But, but also, when, when you have such a group, there's always the notion of Carton subgroup, which is the maximal abelian subgroup, right? So, so what, what is T here? T is simply the transformations. Uh, Z goes to AZ. Th this is a special case of here where you, you take diagonal matrices. Yeah. This is your Carton torus. Uh, we'll, so we'll come back to G in a moment, but let's, let's focus on T because we, when you do Kirby run stuff, you always want to have the BLE groups. So we're going to just talk about T. So what can I say about T? Ah, uh, yeah, right. Um, yeah, so it's a one parameter group where A is not zero, which is what we're saying. Um, and um, by definition, let, let me say that the so something called the equivalent homology, homology of P1 it's going to be roughly the same, but now we're going to have a parameter. The parameter you should imagine as being, broadly speaking, the uh, logarithm of the uh, scaling. 
And so this is already going to be our additive parameter. So this u is basically the spectral parameter. Or more precisely, think of it as the difference of uh, two spectral parameters. This is a system of secretly of size 2, so there are actually, if you like, it's the difference of two spectral parameters, u1 minus u2. But there are only two of them here, so it doesn't need to put the indices. Right, so that's ht. So this is what I'm was about to define, but first I want to this notation. Let me introduce the parameter u, which, morally speaking, is just a complex number, but uh, you, you, you can think of it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm going, going to define. So this is the equivalent, let's say, homology of p1. t is the, so it's t equivalent, so let me write it explicitly, t equivalent. Homology of homology, it's always the same. There's always duality, but let me write it quickly. Homology. Right. I'm not specify, so it's yeah, of P1. Right. So, so what does it mean in practice? It's very simple. That means now we only only apply to consider objects which are invariant in the T. Right. So that means now when you take classes, um, you only allow to use so it's generated by um, classes of T invariant objects. So we, we want to, you know, we want to respect somehow the the, the uh, yes T invariant. So that means we only allow to consider things which are globally invariant under whatever group you take the cohomology of. So here, T. Um, okay. Uh, so, and then the other statement is that actually it's kind of in a fairly general setting, you should get the exact same result in, as in non equivalent homology, but the, the subtlety is you're going to have this parameter. So, in a fairly general, well, let me not say how, gen how much generality, but it's going to be just. C of u squared. So that means it's going to be still generated by two classes, but there's going to be a dependence on the spectral parameter. So that's how you introduce the spectral parameter in the model. So let's play the little game of trying to clarify. So this is in the case of P1, of course. Yeah, P1. Um, of classifying all the T invariant sub varieties of the, of the, the sphere. So first, what, what is this uh, action of uh, T? So T is just the scaling. So for example, if A is of plus one, this is just moving points along. You know, at fixed latitude, or if A is real, on the contrary, it would be like moving points at fixed longitude, I guess, right? So it's some kind of motion of points in the sphere, but the important thing, of course, is that the North Pole and the South Pole never move, right? So, so if you're looking at points, immediately you find that the T-fixed points of P1, uh, they're nothing but the uh, South Pole and the North Pole, which I called zero and infinity here, right? Just because, you know, zero and infinity are invariant by your scale. Not so complicated. And of course, the whole of P1 is also invariant. So that means when you take the class of a point, now you have to distinguish here, either taking the class of 0 or the class of infinity, and these are the, the two allowed points, and then you still have the class of P1. But now comes a little paradox. I claim that the going to the Introducing an introduction of these new parameters shouldn't change like the rank of the group. This should, should still be a space of dimension two, just with dependence of the spectral parameter. But here I have three classes. In, in a space of dimension two, if you have three vectors, they have to be linearly dependent, right? So they have to be somehow linearly dependent. Um, so you, have, you should have something like, uh, oh, and, oh, oh yes, I, should, I also forgot to say that the degree, this new parameter you should always. Uh, Considered to have as having a degree. So there's a homogeneity, implicit homogeneity. So if you write the relation alpha zero plus beta infinity plus gamma equals one, no, equals zero, sorry. Uh, the first you notice is because this has degree one, this has degree one, this has degree zero, so it better be that to compensate, this has a u here. Because this has degree one and this becomes homogeneous. And these are just known numbers. Right? And the second observation is that. Um, if you setting u equals zero, it's like uh, removing uh, the equivalence. This is the kind of a statement. It's like uh, going back to the non-equivalent case, 
And in the non-equivalent case, I have this argument that every point is the same. Even zero and infinity, you can connect them by a line. So they're, they're boundaries of some independence. In this relation, if you set u equals zero, which kills this term, uh, you'd better have zero equals infinity. Uh, that means you should have alpha equals minus beta. So at the end of the day, you get a relation of the form u times p1 equals some number, some rational number in general, uh, whatever it is, alpha over gamma, I don't know. Let me just call it uh, kappa times uh, zero minus infinity. And so the only question to, to find now is what is kappa? And so this I cannot prove using elementary means. Maybe the uh, geometer in the assistance can tell me that it's a simple argument, but the claim is this number is actually equal to one, which is kind of the most natural answer. So this is the so this is the only relation we'll ever need. Let me just remove this kappa, which I mean, if it, if it was there, it wouldn't be a big deal if it was a little bit by renormalization, but the claim is this is the correct answer. And this is the only equation we'll ever need in this topic. Yes. Okay, so this was the setup. Yes. Right, so I, I kind of put it by hand by saying each time, this is kind of a rule that each time you have an equivalent, that means you have to introduce a property which is somehow describes the action. I, I didn't really justify it properly, but this is, if you had a group, you can add n proppers, and they essentially for our spectral parameters, but, but you just add them in the game by saying, as I said here, you had z2, and that I arbitrarily said, now it's going to be z of u squared, so like a module of rank 2 over now polynomials over u. And, um, and also I should mention that um, uh, really, for most purposes, I don't really want to work with integers, like when we do a build spaces of spin chains, we rather think of them as living in some fields, so let me say that, so this is a bit of a side remark, but let me say that this, this notion of localization, which means really here, it means we can always arbitrarily decide that we're not going to deal only with integer numbers, but maybe with arbitrary, say, rational fractions. So let me call this operation tilde. That means it's overkill, but let's say, let, let me say that I uh, just take the, uh, um, Instead, like I'm going to replace rational numbers, let's say, and even arbitrary rational fractions in use. So, in other words, let's ignore the fact that these coefficients were supposed to be integer and polynomials. I'm happy with any rational fractions. I'm going to allow myself to invert any element uh, in the base field, which is this uh, base range, which is zero. So, let's ignore the issues of integer mess, which is not so important. Um, and I'll, I'll add a little tilde to say I allow myself to invert anything I like. Geometrically or physically, like in okay. So geometrically, it's a little bit complicated to explain. I mean, it's it's you, you see in this formula, it's particularly clear. It's, it allows you, for example, to distinguish the points zero and infinity. Because so, how are zero and infinity different points? They're different because if you look, they're fixed points of the action of the torus. But if you look locally, uh, you see that. So suppose, for example, you take a to be greater than one. So what does it mean? It means it's a flow. Okay, so I'm going to screw it up. So Z goes to AZ towards infinity, yeah, like this arrow. Yeah, this is the flow where A is greater to one. Yeah, so you can see how these two points are quite different. This is an acrotic point. This is a repulsive point. Yeah, and, and and you can describe this by computing the weight of the action in the tangent space. That's the technical way you would describe it, and saying that the weight in one case is plus one, the other case is minus one. It's the eigenvalue of the operator uh, locally. Just attractive means it's positive, and repulsive negative, or vice versa. And so this is exactly what this equation is, is writing for you. If I write it, if I allow myself, if I do this localization procedure, which is allowing me to use denominators, this equation is exactly telling you, this, this numerator is exactly the weight at the tangent space. So it's giving you an idea of the behavior of the group around the fixed point. And naturally, you'll, you'll like to introduce this variable because, because if you want to describe the action locally in the tangent space, you'll have to introduce weights. And this here, you can think of it, if you like, as the weight um, of the And yes, so, so that, that was on the geometric side, and on the, on the physical side, it's going to be the spectral property. No, 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 no. So, okay. Yeah, so that, there's a big subtlety here. This manifold is not the manifold of the integrable system. This is some abstract geometric data you give me. It could be anything. No, this is it. I've only, the only thing I care about is it's a space, and it has a group action. And I've already defined these two things for you. The space is P1, and the group action is GL2. This is all I need. Because I'm now going to define an R matrix out of these very simple data for you. 
Okay, so as I said, we're done with the setup, and now the uh, the integrable system. So, so, so far we've only used this TORS T, but now there's a bit of extra data. When you have a, a curve like SL2 or PSL2, whatever, and you have a cut on TORS, you also know that you have something really important, which is the VAL group. And the VAL group, by definition, is the um, normalizer of the TORS. That means things that globally commute with the TORS divided by the TORS itself. And, and in the case of uh, um, SL2 or PGL2, no, N means the normalizer of things which commute. So, uh, G G such that GT equals TG. This is the usual definition of the VAL group. And in, in the present case, for the case of G equals um, GL2, this is just uh, Z2, Z over 2Z. Yeah, there's only one non trivial element of the VAL group, and for example, you can choose it as a. Uh, yeah, so, in, so, so what is it? So Z over 2Z, in practice, it's either the identity operation or the operation, let's say Z goes to 1 over Z, or more generally, any. A over Z. These are the two elements you have by, right? Do you agree that this, this globally preserves the scaling? And the identity most definitely does, and these are the only two classes modular the action of T, right? So, so this, is a, uh, this is really kind of important geometric data, data. And you see that the key point is that uh, when you take a fixed point, it's always sent into another fixed point, right? So for example, so let me call this operation W0. You see that W naught of infinity is here, and W naught of zero is infinity. Yes, so it, it commutes non trivially the fixed point. Okay, so now, now the short version is the R matrix is nothing but the matrix of this. Uh, well, for any element of the bar group, you will define an R matrix, and it will be simply the matrix of this transformation in a, an appropriate basis of uh, homology. So let me write this down. So here, of course, there's only one non trivial element, which means there's only one. So for each W in W, you define, uh, let me see, write it, I'll check W equals the matrix of the transformation W acting. And so the acting thing is annoying because it looks like a G. I don't know how to fix this problem. Acting, acting on H star T in, in our case of G1. So let me explain this. So when you have these operations, by definition, they always send, send a T invariant space to another T invariant space. So here we had this, and I should also say, if you take the whole of P1, it's suddenly sent onto the whole of P1, it's an automorphism. So that means you can, you can think of it as a certain uh, kind of linear transformation of, the, of, the, of this uh, homology space. So, so you, the only question is in, in a certain basis. So in a certain basis, and we'll come back to that. But here, let me, let me tell you the choice that works, and then I'll explain to you a little bit why it's an interesting. Yes. So, so this is correct. Absolutely. So it's, it doesn't look. No, 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 no. Okay, that's the next one. Point. So you should think of the homology as being the whole Hilbert space. So it's, if you like, it's the whole tensor product. Yeah. So here it's it's going to be a chain of length too. But I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But that's a very good point. Yes. So so this will be kind of secretly. It'll be space of chain of length two. Yeah. But that's the uh, HBC. Well, why did I choose two? Because two is precisely already enough to define one R matrix, the one that switches point one and point two. So that's the minimum number for which you can actually define something. So yeah, it'll be space of chain of length two. But I'll come back to that in, in a second. First, I want to find the formula for the R matrix. Okay, so, so which basis? Well, really, there's only one natural basis. Um, which makes sense even without the spectral parameters, which is the point in P1. And we only have to choose whether the point is zero or infinity, but obviously these two choices are related by conjugation. So let's say we choose the basis to be um, P1 and zero. Right? And now we try to write the matrix R check. So, of course, R check of identity is just identity, so that's not terribly exciting. Uh, two by two matrix. So, so, of course, this is always true, this is boring, but in interesting cases, if you take z goes to 1 over c, and here, so I'm going to try to do it without screwing up. So p1, 0. So p1 is sent to p1, so that's easy enough. 1, 0. 
and zero is sent to infinity. So there you actually have to use our unique equation to say that infinity, uh, whatever, is something like P1. Okay, yeah, I screwed up the sign because I'd rather have that's all right. Uh, minus u, uh, sorry, that's u p1 minus 0. Yeah, all right. So I have a sign problem. No, no, this can be, it has to be, no, it's the other way around. Minus, yeah, minus plus. Yes, I think I should got it right. And so you find that here you have minus u, and I'd rather have plus u, but that just means that I screw up my equations. No big deal. All right, so you find this matrix. So this I claim secretly is already the R matrix of the five vertex model, which I think some other people are either going to talk about or yesterday. Great. So yeah. So this is the I claim already is the rational five vertex model. So of course you don't have yet the five vertices, but we, this is related to this comment. So so yeah. Of course, this is a very simple example. Again, you, you're skipping ahead. Maybe if you leave, let me finish this example, then I'll comment on. Yes, the, the point is this strategy works. Yeah, you could. You can do a lot of things. I'll. If you just allow me to finish this example, I'll make a comment on, on the general idea of this construction. Okay, so the first thing is this is not actually five vertices. There are only three non-trivial Boltzmann weights, but that's because I, I, I lied slightly from the beginning. Really, the way you should think about it is this is only the, the, the non-trivial weight space. This is actually, I should say, the inclusion here is the middle weight space. Um, sigma z equals zero. And if you really want to get the other two spaces, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so if, if you want to also get the other weight spaces, you, all, you, you could do the same construction, which is just starting with a point. And for a point, there's nothing that can ever happen. So that means if you actually introduce an extra point, you get one here, one here, and then zero. Well, okay, let me erase this bit. Uh, zero, 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 zero. And then you get the full R matrix of the five vertices model. One, two, three, four, five vertices. Right. So I only, I only kept the uh, non-trivial weight space, the sigma z equals zero, because that's the only place where something interesting happened. If you really wanted to, as I said, you would introduce extra points and take the disjoint union with P1, you would get the whole, the whole thing. Okay, now, um, okay, that was remark number one. Uh, I'm sure I had quite a few more remarks on this. Yes, the, the next thing is, of course, um, this is only the model with two sides, so you only have one R matrix, so you can't even do the young Baxter equation yet because, well, you only have R1, 2, you need at least three sides to have the young Baxter equation. So the first claim is that if you now consider space X to be a so-called Grassmannian, GRKN, uh, which is just this, so, some kind of generalization of projective space. So it's like P, more general than P1, so just some spaces of dimension K inside of space of dimension K. So if you take K equals 1, this is just projective space. And um, so, so in the case we had here, so K equals 1 and equals 2 was just um, Once again, maybe I can just finish this comment and then I'll, it will answer your question. So if you do the same strategy, you'll find that H star of this space, GRKN, is nothing but the kth weight space, um, okay, this is getting a bit low, sorry, weight space of C2 tensor n. So that means this is already the uh, spin chain of my tree length n. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No star. Yeah, sometimes we put a star, but I didn't put it anywhere, so let me not put it. Yeah, H of GR, KN. You can always add, and this is just addition of spectral parameter if you like, but this is a, so you'll have N spectral parameters. Right, so you can do the exact same construction with more general space, and you'll get actually a chain of size N. And the big important point is that now you have R matrices. Okay, so let me continue somewhere else. Now, if you do uh, the general case, you'll have an action of GLN, now or PGLN, will act on X, and that means you will have a volume group which is a symmetric group, SM, and that means you have as many R matrices, for example, as elementary transpositions, as generators of the, the volume group. That means you'll have R check 1, R check U, 
can define using this procedure I check n minus one, and they will always depend on some microprobabilities which are like u1 minus u2, dot 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 u n minus one minus u n. And this automatically, and this is the key point here, automatically um, satisfy the Baxter equations, the Baxter equation, and uh, unitarity, and, and computation when they fall apart. So all, basically, all the Coxeter relations of the Valve group will automatically imply all the nice properties you would expect for an integral system. Right, so, so the, 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 a few more comments before I can uh, say that. Um, yeah, so, so, right, okay. So why automatically? Well, because, because it's the vulgar action. So if you take generators of, of, of the symmetric group, they will satisfy the brain relations. So if you, you know, SN is just generated by T1, Tn minus 1, with relations Ti squared equals 1, and Ti, Ti plus minus 1, Ti equals, well, this one, equals Ti plus 1, Ti, Ti plus 1, yeah, and Ti, Tj, the mute. Yeah, this is a uh, presentation of the symmetric group. Yeah. So if you just take these relations and plug them in into these matrices, be really careful that the T's also act by switching the spectral parameters, you'll get exactly the young Baxter equation. So this, this will be nothing but unitarity, this will be nothing but young Baxter equation. And uh, again, the spectral parameters are taken into account. We've all, all learned that you know the young Baxter equation with spectral parameters is not the same as the Braid relation, but secretly it is. Just you have to pay attention to the switching of the spectral parameters. So everything is fine. Yeah, in this, in this, yes, it's, it's just the, the Coxeter relations for the corresponding ball curves. That means it's something very elementary uh, at the geometric level. The fact that if you take generators of your ball curve, they will satisfy certain. Yes, yes, and then. <laughs> Hopefully, I will actually get to that. So, okay. So, so, so first, let, let me comment on the fact that um, there, there is a. So, if you actually do it for the Grassmannian, there, there's still an trivial point which I didn't emphasize enough. Is you have to make a certain choice of basis. So, in the case of the Grassmannian, if you take arc x equals g r k n, there is indeed a certain basis which I've not explained. This is the so called Schubert basis. Um, I'll just give the name for which the R matrix will look exactly the form that we used to. That means I'll check I will be one tensor dot 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 tensor one tensor the R matrix of size two. So this uh, maybe this one I'll just call without any indices like like this. Maybe just uh, so tensor I check acting on uh, yeah tensor one tensor dot 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 tensor one. And here you have uh, what is I minus one. This acts on space is I I plus one and this acts and this is all the rest I plus two. And, right. So but this is a slightly non-trivial issue. I mean, the, the choice of basis is actually important. So. And uh, changing basis is not as intimate as it looks. You may say, oh, you're just conjugating the R matrix. No, no, no. Changing basis, uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's, changing basis is like doing something called Greenfield twist. So changing basis is equals twisting in the sense of Greenfield of the R matrix. And this is a very non-trivial operation. So that means the choice of basis is actually important. Um, and you have to find sort of the right one. Okay, now come this, comes the section where I will hopefully an answer all your questions. So this general strategy was employed very successfully by uh, various people, but in particular, I should say, mentioned the work of Molik and Kunkov, um, who wrote a very long review um, in 2012, maybe, something like that. Um, in which they, they applied the strategy for X, the so-called Nakajima Kruger variety, which is a fairly general geometric object, uh, which I will not define here, but a very special case being, um, yeah, no, let me not define it as well. Um, and using this strategy, they get all the R matrices, well, first they get all the R matrices of uh, all Youngians of uh, any synclealized type, so that means So that means they get all the rational solutions of young Baxter equation attached to, say, GLN or SO2N or exceptional cases, I guess. And much more, that's the point. Um, in particular, they get some infinite dimensional R matrices, 
uh, which are related to the, this AGT conjecture that uh, some people may know. But so that they, they could actually get a whole suit of, of solutions for the Young Master equation, including many of them which have not, not which have not been studied in detail yet. And, and in particular, the infinite dimensional ones are quite interesting and have become very popular because they related. Yeah, this is the same as AGT. And also related to the, the so-called toroidal algebras. And quite a few people now in our community in integral models uh, getting into that. That's very recently last week a paper by. Uh, Mironov, Marozov, and co-authors in which they study. Yes, absolutely. There is, these are new solutions, but they're infinite dimensional, and this is all rational so far. Yes. So that's that's another good point. Yeah. yeah so let, let me not talk about that. This is. It's yeah. It's okay. Maybe, maybe I have too many things to say. So maybe let me. But there is a connection to AGT, and that was one of the motivations for Molly. The paper of Malik and um, um, yeah, so, so the well, no, no, but you see, th there is no theorem of a general classification of, of solutions in the Ambassador equation. It all, no, 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 all, only no, we, this is, that doesn't preclude the existence of exotic solutions. Exactly. Precisely. So I was going to get there. So. Okay. Well, the first thing is: do, do, do these? There, there are some te technical substitutions. Like, for example, do these infinite dimensional cases apply? I think it's also only finite dimensional, right? So these are infinite, the, the new cases are mostly infinite dimensional. And also, as you just said, nothing precludes the existence of solutions which have no classical analog. And, and so, so I think here there's a lot of uh, basically. I think there's a lot of work to be done to see how far th their construction works. But um, yeah, so let, let me not say more on this. Okay, the next thing, so the, a few more comments. The next comment is that indeed you can generalize this to uh, the, the uh, uh, yeah, trigonometric and even elliptic. So the trigonometric case was done by a variety of people. As I said, uh, Rumani, Tarasov, Batch, and Co. wrote a paper about this. Uh, Koff and Kokunov wrote a paper about this, uh, about the, 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 the cross Mayan case. And, and, and even the elliptic case has now. Uh, been uh, more or less clarified by um, Kukunkov and what's her name? Uh, uh, so some, okay. Some very recent paper like came out in April by Kukunkov and a collaborator in which they even do the elliptic case. So in principle, this is, I wouldn't say it's straightforward, it's not at all straightforward, but you can go on and do it also to geometric elliptic cases. Okay, so finally in the remaining, this, this is what I wanted to check, I forgot, uh, 20 minutes, I have, uh, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so I want to uh, do the, the case of the six vertex model, let's say, or at least the, the, the next non-trivial case beyond um, five vertex. As you see, five vertex is a bit of a weird degenerate limit of the six vertex model. So the natural question is, where is the six vertex model? And, and, and here, you, again, we'll encounter once more this issue, which I'm uh, you know, boxed about, which is the issue of the choice of basis. So we'll at least very schematically, I will discuss this issue. So, 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 yes. And the final question I want to address is generalize this to a non-degenerate model, for example, six vertex, or we'll see equivalently a loop model. Um, and so we'll see. We have two choices corresponding to two cho choices of the uh, basis, and they will give, of course, two equivalent integral models. But still, it's kind of an interesting. And um, right. so, so how to do this? So the first thing is to consider not the G1, but something already. Okay, I promised we wouldn't go further than G1, but we're going to do something slightly more complicated. We're going to introduce the tangent bundle of G1. So the, the total space, that means, you know, when you, when you have any space, you can always define the smooth, you know, manifold algebra variety. You can always define the tangent, the, the total space of the tangent bundle, which is, you know, like X phi, where X is a point in X, and phi is some linear form on the tangent space. Yeah, this is the so-called tangent bundle. So let's do it for P1. So T star P1 is whatever it is. I, I'm not going to give any more explicit description. It's a certain two-dimensional complex variety, uh, which has a, okay, you can describe it more explicitly in coordinates, but it wouldn't be terribly exciting unless, yeah, I don't know how much to say about it. Um, the, first, the, the first remark you should, you should say, oh, this is really a stupid idea, because when you have a, a, a vector bundle over a space, it's, you can always contract the fibers. And so that means immediately you know that H of T star P1 is the same as H of P1, that means you've done nothing. 
you just contract all the fibers. Uh, but, but this is actually a good thing, because if you want to go from five vertex to six vertex, you don't actually want to change the build space. The build space should, should still be C to tensor N. So it's a good thing that it hasn't changed. But the, the, so the interesting thing is, and, and this remark could work for any cross mining. If you take the tangent level of the cross mining, uh, you can get, so you get for any size of the spin chain. So why is it still an interesting thing? Well, because when you do the contention model, there is an additional um, group action. Remember, the geometric data is always the space and the group action. And, and the, the, the group action is actually a little bit bigger because when you, have, when you have a vector bubble, there's always an extra action, which is scaling of the fiber. That means here, you can always do this new action, which I always call T, uh, like this, where T is some non-zero complex number. So you, always, you can always take whatever group was acting on X and multiply it by C star, and you'll get a new action. So here, that means acting on this space is my PGL2 plus C star. And inside this sits the Toro, toro Catus, which is, which is just C star plus C star. That means now we have, if you like, you have two parameters. You have the spectral parameter, which was, um, you know, like, um, so if, if the scaling was like, a, in our case, Z goes to AZ, remember I said, roughly speaking, the spectral parameter is like the logarithm. So in the same way here, I can say T is uh, exponential, and H bar is the usual notation. Don't ask me why H bar it has little to do with the, the H bar in physics, but that means in practice, uh, if you take now the, the, the equivalent cohomology of T star P1, you have two parameters, the spectral parameter and some kind of spectator parameter, which is this H bar. And this H bar, you need it to build the R matrix of the, of the six vertex model because you need homogeneous coordinates, and so you need an expert parameter. So that's good. Okay. So, so the rest of the story is pretty much the same as in the five vertex. You have the same basis of fixed points and everything. Everything is pretty much the same, but you have just one extra parameter to play with. And the only subtlety is the choice of basis. And, um, and this is actually a very interesting point. Um, I, a long time ago when I did this, I knew nothing about algebraic geometry, and that was kind of the natural choice we found with our collaborator. This is the naive choice which generalized the Schubert case, so let me call it polynomial Schubert. I won't define it, but this is kind of the naive geometric basis you can find. Uh, and then there, there's the fancy basis, and that's that's open curve, so this is me. And then that's the fancy basis, which is the so-called stable basis of uh, um, open curve and collaborators. O is for open curve, it's not a zero. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, but the, the problem is that this basis is it's very non-trivial geometrically. In fact, it's not defined geometrically. It's defined purely algebraically in terms of uh, axioms of what this basis should satisfy and then proving that it actually exists. So from my point of view, it's not completely satisfactory and I worked a lot on making this description more geometric. But anyway, if you ignore that, uh, the, the interesting, so the, the fancy basis is the one that will, which give, will give you the correct result, which means it will give you the six vertex model. So if you do the exact same construction, you'll find that the R matrix now is of the form so if you do it for T star P1, it's going to be, okay, let me first write it as I know it should be, it should be, uh, so this is object, so it should be the identity, so H bar plus UP divided by H bar plus U, so that means the two by two central block is something like, uh, I don't know, H bar over H bar plus U, U over H bar plus U, U over H bar plus U, H bar over H bar plus U, and you also have to have, uh, as usual, you have to add a 1 and a 1 here, and you actually get 6 non trivial weights, and that's the 6 vertex model. And you see the H bar is important because it's the one that ensures that you can write a non trivial relation, which is homogeneous, basically. Non trivial R matrix, which is homogeneous in these properties. So that works great. Um, but that's fairly non trivial to guess, let's say. And this, again, the, this construction is only from like 2012. No, 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 I went back to rational, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 in, in this, I only mentioned here these two things, but I'll never actually give the, the these are too complicated to explain. In, this is the rational six vertex. Yeah. It's the same one that was introduced in the previous talk. It's h bar plus u times permutation. Well, uh, one plus u permutation, whatever. But, uh, yes, so from, yeah, it's the special point delta equals plus or minus one, depending on your sign conventions of the six vertex model. Again, this could also be done in geometric case, but it's, it would be way too complicated to explain in a one hour talk. There are quite a few subtleties in K theory. K theory is a more subtle theory than um, homology, and you have to, 
and especially if you want to explain it homologically as I did here. Yeah, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, if you prefer, this is XXX. Yes. Yeah, maybe I should have made this one. All right. Now, the interesting thing is that the naive approach actually also works. It just gives, it gives you something different. It gives you the um, loop model version of the... Uh, it's, it's actually not very far. I mean, the, the twist here is kind of trivial. It's the change of basis from six vertex to loop model. So let me explain. Find me that, and then if I have time, I'll explain what this all has to do with what are the most important first pieces. So I doubt I'll get that written. Right, so that's a lot of questions to, to subtract from my <laughs> time. So it's all right, I, I don't mind, but I, I do want to say at least one more thing before I, I finish. Um, yes, so if you do, in the LP case, you have one big subtlety here is that you always want to have solutions which respect the weight space decomposition. That means you cannot find the eight vertex model for geometry, it makes no sense because the eight vertex model mixes up the, uh, it doesn't reproduce up some messy unit. But, but, but of course, we also know, and this is actually something I discussed many years ago with Andre, that there is an equivalent formulation of the eight vertex model due to Baxter many years ago. He explained to us that you can also write in terms of this SOS model, which is where now you have a solution of the dynamical and Baxter equation, but now it's actually a six vertex model of this kind, which means it preserves the, the weight space. Right? You have this uh, vertex IRF transformation, which allows you to formulate this in terms of a dynamical, if you like, if you prefer to use this language, dynamical R matrix, uh, which is a six vertex type. And this is the one you'll get from the, from the geometry. And um, yeah, I'll have, I'll, have, I'll have a lot more to say about the LP case, but really this is complicated. But, but yes, it does work, and you, you will find more like dynamical solutions of the Baxter model, which is fine. I mean, there, from this kind of general point of view, you see dynamical makes no difference. It still effectively consider relations for the, the corresponding, uh, for, for the type A uh, odd group. Dynamical is a big word, but really that doesn't change anything to the, stru the underlying structure. I mean, this is satisfied consider relations in these R matrices. All right. Um, yeah, so so if you do it with the the first choice, so this is like, so number one, number two, number two will give you six vertex. Number one give, will give you an, uh, an equivalent model, which is one of my favorite models, which many people in this audience know very well, which is this tempo leap model of uh, loops. And um, this is a model where you have Usually it's presented this way, you have two little elementary plaquettes. And, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe it, it also fit in a group stop, I have no idea if, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, and so you're supposed to glue these things together and, and there you can have some local Boltzmann weights which are fairly equivalent, but the key point is when you have a closed loop, uh, you give it a weight of the tau, where tau is this uh, parameter. And since we're doing the rational model, actually tau is actually equal, always equal to two, but if you did it in the trigonometric case, tau would be an arbitrary number. So this is the weight of the loop. And, and when you study this model, you, so you, you have to introduce the uh, transfer matrix, and immediately you, fi you, you find the, uh, um, so the, what is the Hilbert space of the, on which the, if you like, the transfer matrix works? It's this space of uh, connectivities, so space of link patterns, maybe. So this, this means like, let's, let's assume that now that we are in even size, so it's pairings of endpoints, Half plane, this is. Let me give you an example. End points, half plane. So, so let's always assume here n is even, so that the pairing actually makes sense. So, for example, at n equals four, of planar pairings, I should say. So, for for example, in, in, if you have a system of size four, that means you allow you, you put four points. And you have to connect them in pairs in such a way that you know, they don't cross. So there's only two ways you can do that, this way and this way. Right? So you take basically formal linear combinations. So this is like your basis of your Hilbert space. It's a prescribed basis. So here it's a two-dimensional space. For n equals four, in general, you have cat one and one, two, such you know, link patterns. And the R matrix has a very simple form. The R matrix is just given by, so I'm probably going to scrub the um, normalization. So it's probably again like one over h bar plus u, I guess. And um, so there's going to be a u times e i, so object i times e i. And so that this is the coefficient I'm going to scrub. So uh, some coefficient times the identity. I can try to cheat, but it's probably something like h bar minus u, probably. I could probably do this is correct. 
And so what is EI? I only have to define to you what, what this EI does. And this is this temporary ge generator. So TL always stands for, yeah, I should have said this is temporary. So, so this is the step leap generator, uh, which is uh, diagrammatically described as something like i i plus one i i plus one. So it's the thing that takes a link pattern and then reconnects i i plus one together, and then um, um, so so for example, let, let me give you an example again. This is probably the best description. When you take e two acting on the, this thing, uh, you just glue together this with this extra thing, and then you pull on the strings. And you get, in this case, this thing. Okay. So you kind of absorb this thing into the picture, and you get this thing. This is, the, this is kind of very schematic description of the uh, action of uh, yeah, temple leap on, on certain, certain space. And so, so now if you take this linear permutation, I claim that these objects is by the young Baxter equation. And if I got the normalization right, probably even the unitarity equation. And, and the claim is this exactly what you get out of, the, of this geometry. And I find it very, when I find this, at first I find this very striking and very weird that this kind of non-local model of loops comes out naturally out of the, the geometry. Anyway, so probably want to say a few more things about that. Um, I, uh, I already mentioned that, that the fact that the, so the loop weight is a free proper, but actually if you do it in, in the rational case, you're forced to have loop weight equal to two. And that's again, this tau is the same as delta in the like, sigma next model, it's like delta two delta maybe, or minus two delta, I forget. So it's, it's, it's Oh yeah, but then it would be minus two. But let's just say plus two. It, 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 there are some conventions. Um, so that means if you're only doing the rational case, you're forced to have time plus two, but in general, it will be equal to q plus two inverse. Oh, let me write it t plus t inverse. Ah, q plus two inverse. Where q is the quantum def deformation proper. So if you do the trigonometric case, you actually have the freedom of choosing any any loop weight. Uh, again, that implies doing all, all this whole geometry in the, in the context of case theory, which is quite complicated. Um, so let me conclude with uh, a few words about that. About the, and the reason that I'm interested in, in this formulation in terms of temporal leap, this uh, all has to do with an old story, which is this uh, Erasmus story of uh, correspondence. So I want to conclude with this. So maybe let me erase. So in other words, I'm going to show you that you can extract a little bit more information from this geometry than just um, the R matrix. In fact, you, you can extract essentially anything. You can get the transit matrix, you can get a lot of stuff that can come up, comes out for free. But one, especially one ingredient I'm interested in, and this is the following. Um, so suppose you do it for, as I said, for, for n sites. So, you, so if you do it for t, let me do it. Let me tell you the most general case for which I know how to do everything completely explicitly. So let's do even the K theory. So K stands for K theory of T star T R K N. This is like doing the temporal leap model with arbitrary loop weight. So tau equals uh, Q plus Q inverse. So Q is secretly related to this T. So I guess, you know, anyway, Q is T one half, where T is the geometric parameter of scaling. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's say so tau arbitrary. Um, and the N here stands for a chain of, of size N. And with, uh, in fact, I should point out that th this most recent work is in collaboration with Alan, Alan Goodson. So K equals CJ. And it's still a work in, uh, well, hopefully the paper will be up very soon. We construct explicitly in the, 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 the corresponding basis, so geometrically, not in the abstract way that uh, most people do, very explicitly geometrically, that the basis of K theory that's needed to do the work and produce this temporally model of loops. Uh, so this is a very explicit construction. Um, and, and the final thing we do is as follows. So what does it mean in practice? We have a bunch of, um, we have a basis which is naturally indexed by these link patterns. That means we have a basis of this K theory, basis indexed by link, link patterns. So the elements of this thing, but this is in some sense a little bit too much information. It's too much information, so we're gonna extract something out of there. And, and we're gonna do the following operation, which will make the specialists scream. I'm gonna say, there's always, a, oh yes, this is K equivalent K theory. There's always a, an operation which you can do. When you have a space, you can always push forward, you can always send it to a point. That means there's a, always a trivial map from any space to a point, which just sends every element of that space to a point. This is, and if you do it in K theory, that gives you a so-called push forward map. 
and K, the K theory of a point is just basically just numbers. It means just, uh, let's say, it, oh, it means just a bunch of numbers depending on T or H bar, if you like T equals a dimensional H bar in the trigonometric case, and then spectral brothers, and there are like N spectral brothers, C1, C2. So why they should specialists jump when they see this? Because this doesn't make sense, because this space is not objective, and therefore this map is not proper. So let's ignore the not properness by saying this is all in localized if you run K theory, and therefore I allow myself denominators and everything is okay. So I close this technical parenthesis. Um, so that means in practice, for every basis element, you can associate to it a certain object, which is a polynomial psi by polynomial or rational function in general, of one parameter, which is t, which is morally speaking q squared, and then z1 spectral parameters. And this is typically a rational function, or even a polynomial or Laurent polynomial, depending. Yeah, let's say a little something like that. And pi here is just a name for linked letter, so maybe it's not a very good letter, but lambda. Where if I think better than So you have a collection of pol polynomials, let's say in the simplest case, uh, indexed by leap patterns. And, and the big claim of this paper we're writing now, final claim, is that these psi lambda, a solution of the uh, level one, this is the level that was briefly mentioned in the previous talk, quantum Pijnik, uh, the logic of equation. Okay, so this is the uh, very non trivial statement. Um, which is, I, I agree at this stage comes out a bit of, out of nowhere, but um, it's true. Um, so why is this true? It, it's a long story. In fact, we in, in the rational case we already kind of found this with a few Francesco and Anne some ten years ago, and then in 2011 we managed to prove this with um, Grimani and Tarasov and Vashenkov, and um, and this is the very non-trivial trigonometric. Tri so this is trigonometric to KZ right now rational case. This is a very uh, non-trivial generalization of this result that we find. And, and, and the reason I'm interested, so this is not any solution, this is the fact of, of the polynomial, or again, let's say Laurent polynomial uh, solution. So if you think carefully, there's only one solution of the double metric case equation with you know this particular setup, uh, which is a polynomial. All the other solutions have a complicated analytic behavior. And so this is it. And this one uh, appeared naturally in the work of uh, in my work with Ludwig Francesco. So this is uh, related to uh, the so-called uh, um, yeah. so re so related to the Sodorazmov uh, Stroganov uh, correspondence because there, okay, in the following ways, so that will be my final remark, um, as follows. So you have this parameter t, or yeah. So I've changed the names many times. T with exponential h bar, but it's also q squared, where q is the usual. Deformation parameter. So if you take t to be a cubic root of infinity, non-trivial, so t to be exponential plus or minus two pi i over three, which sounds very arbitrary from a geometric perspective. By the way, I, I have some things to say, but so this is this continuation of this comment. So remark, remark continued. If you set t to be exponential plus or minus two pi pi over three, now you have just a polynomial. Up. So you have a bunch of polynomials depending just on spectral parameters z1, zn, or n to the size of the system. This, this is nothing but the ground state um, of, the, of the loop model, so the same loop model, so of the loop model, definitely loop model, uh, at the corresponding value of tau. And if I did not screw up everything, tau is supposed to be, yeah, so I did, so I guess I really want the sign to be, ah, uh, but then I put a square root here. Anyway, the claim is that if you, if you take this cubic root, it should be tau equals plus one. So I can always adjust the formula so that it actually works. Um, yeah. Q is a sixth root of unity, so yeah, there's a sign problem. Fine, let me just put a minus sign. Yeah, problem fixed. So if you, if you, if you set T to, be, to this value or Q to be the square root, of course it depends which square root you choose. Yeah, exactly. So it's plus or minus depending on which square root. But let's say you take Q to be exponential to a i pi over three, and you'll find that the corresponding loop weight is one. So effectively, at the end of this very long operation, you find explicit ground state for the template loop model, but only at a very specific value of the loop weight, which is this very non-trivial value, which is in the middle of the trigonometric regime. And geometrically, it's not so clear what it means, because it would correspond naively to sort of c over 3z equivalent k theory, which makes absolutely no sense. So this is still, a, the, the final connection is a bit mysterious, but um, uh, okay, so I should probably conclude. Um, so I, I tried to convince you that, that this potential for giving a lot of information, um, 
quantum integral systems out of very simple geometric data with some subtleties, especially this choice of basis is a very simple point. I should also point out, since uh, ah, yeah, yeah, so this conference is about boundary degrees of freedom, so I should say something about the boundary degrees. I've done everything here in type A, which means I've always, this, in, in this whole talk I've discussed a variety of variety X with an action of GLN, basically, or GGLN, doesn't matter, but it's, you know, type A or SLN, this is all the same, basically, it's type A. So if you choose varieties which have an action of, say, the symplectic group or the orthogonal group, uh, then you'll find R matrices which satisfy the corresponding capacitor relations, and that typically means you'll find um, systems with a boundary. That means if you look at the, suppose now you replace GLN with, I don't know which one is my favorite one, yeah, SP, SPN, let's say, or so it's plus one, let's say. If you look at the um, thinking diagram of um, SP, SP, uh, SPN or SO twin plus one, this is typically what you get. You have a double edge here. And so if you write the corresponding coxter relation, it's a quartic relation. And this is nothing once you put back this microprimer as the reflection equation. So if you do the same construction but using uh, symplectic or orthogonal uh, invariant varieties, uh, you will get for free solutions of the reflection equation. And this has been absolutely, this is completely unknown territory. Nobody has looked at this yet. So I think it's, this, is, this is something we're investigating with this paper. Thank you.